Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Benjamin Mall. I'm the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. The Free Market Institute was founded in 2013 due to the vision and generosity of a West Texas rancher. Our mission is to promote the study and teaching of free market economics and the institutional environment necessary for the free enterprise system to flourish and promote widespread prosperity. Uh, since our founding, we've grown tremendously and are now one of the largest such educational institutes at a major U.S. university. That growth has only been possible because of the support of generous Texans and foundations in Texas that have uh, enabled us to grow. Uh, my thanks to all of them in this, in particular, uh, Kate and Chris Matthews, who are here tonight, who helped us scale up in our, our first big move up after our, our founding. Uh, I've said it many times, West Texas and Texas Tech is an ideal environment to run a place called the Free Market Institute. And it's from the support of the community and you all coming out like this, uh, but also the leadership at the university. I thank Ted Mitchell for being here today, Chancellor of the System, uh, and of course, Lawrence Skubinick, the president, uh, who was instrumental in our founding and subsequent growth for providing an environment where this institute can flourish. Uh, in regards to tonight's program specifically, I'd like to thank the sponsors who made that possible, uh, including former Texas Tech Regent Nancy Neal and her husband, Dr. Tom Neal, thank you, and our co-sponsor for the event, the Young Americas Foundation. The Young Americas Foundation is a national youth organization whose mission is to ensure that increasing numbers of young people across the country are inspired by the ideas of individual freedom, free enterprise, and limited government. Uh, in addition to sponsoring campus lectures like this one, the Young Americas Foundation orga organizes student charters, chapters excuse me, on campus, hosts student conferences, and preserves the Ronald Reagan Ranch in California and the Ronald Reagan Boyhood Home in Illinois as historical uh, presidential properties for students to learn about America's 40th president. To learn more about our co-sponsor, you can visit their website, uh, yaf.org, or see their display table that has some of their promotional materials in the back of the room. It is my honor tonight to introduce Mr. Steve Forbes. Steve Forbes is the chairman and editor-in-chief of Forbes Media and an internationally respected authority in the worlds of economics, finance, and corporate leadership. Forbes magazine was first published in 1917 and continues to be one of the leading global business publications today. Steve's ability to communicate economic ideas and influence policy reaches far beyond Forbes magazine. He's appeared frequently on virtually every major news network, probably most frequently Fox News, where in fact it wasn't the first time I met you, Steve. I think it was one of the first few times, though, that we were sitting in the green room in, in New York in the studios waiting to go on possibly Stossel or the judge is free to watch one of those shows. Um, in addition to the, in the media, he also communicates uh, through his books. He's published eight books, the most recent of which, Inflation, What It Is, Why It's Bad, and How to Fix It. But Steve has a particular knack for titling his books things that are near and dear to the heart of the Free Market Institute. I'm thinking of titles such as How Capitalism Will Save Us and Why Free People in Free Market Are the Best Answer in Today's Economy. Or, the Freedom Manifesto, Why Free Markets Are Moral and Big Government Is Not. <laughs> Mr. Forbes, of course, is also known for his involvement in politics, but you might have noticed that FMI does not generally have politicians as our public speakers. And that's because we're all about ideas and not partisan politics. Uh, however, when I think of Steve, I've always thought of him more as a public intellectual and policy expert than as a politician. But as many of you are likely aware, in both 1996 and 2000, Steve campaigned vigorously for the Republican nomination for the presidency. Keys to his platform were the flat tax, medical savings accounts, the ability to partially opt out of Social Security and set direct funds into private savings accounts, free trade, and school choice. All issues that remain relevant today and that I'm sure Steve might have more to say about tonight. Please join me in wel welcoming Steve Forrest. like that, I'll just say thank you and good evening. And I'm the day. But it is a thank you very much, Ben, for those very kind words, and thank all of you for coming out here tonight. <clears throat> I hope you survive what I say, uh, but uh, you're a captive audience, and I heard you're very polite. Unfortunately, there's no food served, so uh, I won't be uh, getting some un 
wanted missiles coming my way. <laughs> but it is good fun to be here, and uh, it's a very a troubled time. Uh, the world is a troubled place right now, economically. Post-COVID, economies should have been surging. Instead, they're doing just the opposite. Most are treading water or actually declining. The developing countries are languishing. That's going to have political implications in the future, especially with developing countries. China says that it's going to grow 5% this year, but nobody trusts their numbers anymore, especially when you have very high youthful unemployment. And the property market, which has been a big driver of that country's economy, is still in very deep trouble. By the way, uh, one thing they are doing, uh, though growing, is their military. Very uh, real expansion at a time when, in real terms, we're declining. They're expanding. And that's going to have dire implications unless we drastically reverse that and do uh, big things after the elections this November. They're also very good at electronic, cheap electronic vehicles, uh, but I don't think we'll be seeing too many of those. Uh, Americans like, uh, I should say this, EVs are nice, but most of us prefer the traditional car and truck, which uh, unfortunately in Washington they don't like. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, you look at the developed or advanced economies, Germany, Japan, and Britain, they're all in recession or close to it. Now, President Biden likes to boast that the U.S. has the best economy in the world. Uh, what a world. And our performance, our own performance by historic standards, is substandard. It's unhealthily buttressed by massive government spending. Amazingly, given the way they concoct the GDP numbers, gross to domestic product numbers that we get every quarter, they count government spending as a plus, not a minus. So the more checks that Uncle Sam sends out, the more Uncle Sam spends, the better the GDP number looks. And so in terms of a higher GDP, it rests on a very shaky foundation not of uh, investment, you want good investment for the future, that's languishing. So it's been consumer spending and government spending. This year the government's going to uh, shell out over $7 trillion. These numbers are so big you can't even comprehend them. Uh, but that's more, that $7 trillion is more than the height of spending during the COVID crisis. When you think there'd be emergency spending would spike up and then after the crisis is over, you'd think that it would uh, come down. No, it's still higher. And this year, if the president gets his budget, which I hope he won't, it'll go even higher. So in terms of inflation, uh, the inflation numbers are not to be believed. Uh, unfortunately, that reflects so much of what we get from the government. The other day, a former Treasury Secretary, Democrat, Larry Summers, pointed out in an article with several other economists that amazingly, the CPI number, which is supposed to measure the cost of living, does not include the cost of mortgages does not include the cost of car payments, does not include the interest you pay on credit cards. And they figure that if you actually included what you pay in interest payments each month, the height of inflation would not have been 9.2%, but 18%. And today, where they tell us it was around three, actually they calculated it's 7%. So that's why even though Joe Biden says the economy is glorious, uh, most people uh, look at uh, their monthly bills, go shopping, and see, ain't quite so. So in terms of post-COVID, you think with the supply chains recovering, the economy should be booming, and it isn't. That raises the question, and that raises the question as to why. Why aren't we doing better? And, the country, and one big answer is debt. The world is drowning in debt. World debt today, again, these numbers are so mind-boggling, is $300 trillion. Three, oh, three times the size of the global economy. In our country, it's already a crisis. We're just reaching the size of our economy, over 100% of GDP. Globally, it's uh, three times. So there's a disaster out there. So our, our debt is bad. Japan proportion is even worse than ours. Theirs is over 250% of GDP. Wow. Now we can still borrow, because we're still seen as the best show on earth, uh, but what we're doing now, and this has not gotten much play yet, is there are massive government borrowing, and this in peacetime, massive government borrowing, even though unemployment is still officially low, we're spending as if we're in wartime or an emergency. 
And as a result, we're going to continue to borrow trillions of more dollars each year. And where is that coming from? Not only from the American people, but in effect, we're sucking it out to the rest of the world. Not for a great growth, but simply for government programs. So the problem is not the problem with the global economy, the problem with our economy is too much government and not enough free enterprise, not enough capitalism. So I'll make the case tonight, capitalism is, capitalism is not the problem, capitalism is the answer. Capitalism is the solution. And that is the freedom to better your life, as Abraham Lincoln put it, to improve your lot in life. The freedom to create, to do things without being oppressed by government. I'll just give you one example. There's cities out there. So many years ago, the New York Times did a story on an upstate orchard, apple orchard in New York. This traditional apple orchard is faced with 5,000 different rules and regulations from 17 different programs and, uh, and, and agencies. 5,000 is for growing apples. And one of the regulations is that when they take the apples off the tree and put them in the cart, to take them to the shed to wash them off, between the trees and the shed, they have to put tarpaulin over the apples. Now, why do they have to do that? Because the regulators say, if you don't cover the apples, it might have get bird poop on it. Now, think of that for a moment. The apples have been on the trees for five months. The birds have been flying around. And to, but to take the apples, to wash them off in the shed, you got to put tarpaulin on it. So that's the kind of thing that just uh, really uh, hurts capital creation hurts the enabled ability to people to do good things. Now let me just share with you uh, just three quick uh, examples of the kind of entrepreneurship, not the big kind that we read about, but the traditional kind that has a profound impact that people are doing things all the time and not waiting for permission to do it. I'll give you one example. And by the way, if you go on a, a site which has a strange sounding name, is it? I-Z-Z-I-T. It's an educational site. I don't know how they came up with the name. But anyway, I've done a, a group of a little short stories on biographies of people you've never heard of who've done great things, only three minutes long. It's to enable students and teachers to not, where I don't preach free enterprise, we just give stories of people who practice it. And I think that's the best way to get points across. One example is a woman none of you have heard of called Margaret Rutkin. Margaret Rutkin, back in the 1930s, one of her children uh, had problems with, with his health and he couldn't eat processed bread. So she decided that she'd make a bread that he could eat. And uh, she, her first attempts at it, using a whole pre-cured kind of wheat and the other ingredients she had, was like a rock, but she persisted and eventually invented what we call uh, modern whole wheat bread. And it uh, worked with her child. The doctor said, this is great. He's gonna recommend it to other patients. And so uh, she became, went into the bread business. She decided to call uh, her new enterprise after the farm she lived on, Pepperidge Farm. Yeah. And, and, and so uh, then she, in later years, went to Europe, found a great chocolate formula in, in Belgium. And hence, we got cookies like Milano, and things that we shouldn't eat but love to eat. And a trip to Switzerland gave us goldfish crackers. Now, that kind of thing could never come from a central planner, never could have come from uh, a committee. It's just a woman had a child with a health problem, and she dealt with it in a way that not only benefited the kid, but also benefited all of us. Well, I'm not sure nutritionists would always agree, but I don't think as a parent in the country with a small kid who doesn't like those goldfish uh, from, from, from time to time. Uh, another example is a guy named Malcolm McLean, a trucker in the 30s and 40s, uh, hated the long distance driving, and decided to came up with the idea, not an original one, why not put a truck on a flat uh, ship and ship it that way? You realize you don't have to put the whole truck on. But he invented what they call the box, containers. And if you think something simple like that, the idea had been around forever, but he developed it. It came up with the way it could work. Faced huge obstacles. The unions hated it. The ports hated it because it would mean a big investment in new infrastructure and the like. Uh, but he went ahead and uh, really invented modern trade. Uh, at first, it was very slow going, and then it became something the world couldn't live without. And before he came along with the box, uh, shipping was extremely expensive. It was backbreaking labor, a lot of pilferages, a lot of breakage, and shipping costs went down 95% in 
thanks to containers. And things like this that we take uh, for granted involve very sophisticated supply chains. Never could have been done without the box and the huge reduction in cost so you could bring parts all around the world, make these things we take for granted. <clears throat> Another example is Annie Malone, African-American woman over 120 years ago, uh, before women were allowed to vote at a time of intense racism. She saw a need in her community for certain hair products and the like, and she started a, a, a cosmetics business with uh, brushes and the like that uh, became worldwide. At the height, she did a really pioneered door-to-door -door selling that Avon and others have picked up on. At the height, she uh, became a millionaire, which like today a billionaire. Uh, she had 75,000 agents around the world, here in America, Philippines, and elsewhere, selling these products. And uh, this shows that even in the face of intense obstacles, if you have basic free enterprise, uh, you can get things done, amazingly get things done. And when you remove those obstacles, even greater things get done. I just uh, cite those as just examples of countless thousands out there. We're in a free enterprise system, by golly, things you could never even imagine come along, most people from most unlikely backgrounds come along and do great things. So in terms of uh, capitalism itself, just remember a, a couple of numbers. In a little over 200 years that we've had modern capitalism, uh, with Adam Smith, but it actually started so the beginnings of it before then. But in 1800, in 1800, 90% of the world lived in dire poverty. Now what is dire poverty? Living on $2.10 a day in today's money. Not money then, but in today's money. Per capita in two dollars and ten cents. Pretty rough existence, which is why people didn't live very long. Today, over ninety percent live outside of dire poverty. Dire poverty is going from ninety percent to a little about eight percent of the world's population today. That came with capitalism. Three thousand years before that, people had made progress, but nothing like what happened after the late 1700s and 1800s exponential growth compared to what had happened before. And that came because of capitalism. So, and so today, this leads to the question, okay, if it's so great, why do we have these problems around the world? Why are we growing at such a slow pace? Why aren't we doing better? And the answer is modern socialism. Those of you who know about socialism know that the traditional kind of socialism came from Karl Marx, was that the government would own everything, Amazon, Walmart, the whole works. The modern socialists realize you don't have to own companies, you don't have to own enterprises or businesses, you can control them through massive regulation. So they can't exist without you, or put hobbles in, uh, barriers in that uh, hurt your progress. And if you're not nice to the bureaucracies and the politicians, you will be hurt, you will not be allowed to advance. Modern socialism, doing it through, doing it through regulation. In the last few years, regulations have come in that are costing the economy, again, one of these mind-numbing numbers, $3 trillion, both for hitting businesses and hitting uh, your own personal lives. In California, for example, they want to put a device in the car that allow a, a bureaucrats to see how fast you're driving every minute of the day. And so if you go above what they think is a proper speed limit, uh, they can gig you automatically. We're already getting a taste of that of some of the other devices around. But that's the kind of thing, not only controlling business, but controlling your own personal life. Now, the far left, unfortunately, controls the Biden administration. And, and it's amazing a small group of people could have that kind of outsized influence. But they are there. They, they cave every time these people make a demand. So they're waging wars on cars and trucks. The internal combustion engine is now under assault. And make no mistake, they just don't want EVs. They want to do away with cars altogether. They want to do away with the, any kind of freedom. They see the car as an enemy to them because it means you can go where you want when you want. And in a vehicle of your own choice. And so right now, this thing pushed for EVs is simply a way station to ultimately just making the cars back to something you have in the Smithsonian. Not quite, but almost. And so they don't ban automobiles or 
things like that. They just regulate them out of existence. For example, gas stoves. A year and a half ago, they floated the idea of banning gas stoves for no good real reason. However, that got a lot of blowback. So instead, they put in regulations that will make 96% of the gas stoves illegal. Don't ban them, just regulate them out of existence. And so their latest on uh, internal on, uh, emissions from tailpipes, they're using that as an excuse to where uh, by 2032, 56% of the cars have to be EVs, whether you like them or not. That's not going to happen because the other, nobody want, the people want to buy them, but it's about 10% of the market. In a free market, you find 8 to 10% like uh, EVs, especially ones that uh, made by Tesla, when it's the only one who knows how to make money on these things. But the rest of the industry doesn't. Uh, Ford last quarter lost over $30,000 in each EV they made. So unless that thing is changed, the auto industry is going to go broke, and they're going to have to go to Washington for a massive bailout, which is a virtual takeover. They're all already virtually uh, being taken over today. And in terms of the internal combustion engine, what they want to do by regulation, again, they won't ban the car, they'll just make it unaffordable, unavailable through regulation and high costs. So a car you might pay $50,000, $40,000 today, you'll be paying $100,000, $120,000, just put it out of people's reach. So they don't do it by a vote. They never went before Congress and say, should we get rid of the internal combustion engine? They just do it by decree in the middle of the night with these uh, regulations that people overlook. So in, ter in terms of, in terms of uh, democracy, this is the antithesis of democracy. You have the world, you have the world in terms of, and by the way, the truth is, in terms of emissions, cars are getting better and better. They're not so bad anymore. And remember, 95% of the time, the vehicle's not being used. So it's just sitting there, doing nothing. That's how you got Uber, finally put some of these things to work. But, so it, it's not, a, it's not the, the crisis is not the car. It's they just want to get rid of it. And so it's no decree. So also, you well know, better than most, they're also waging war on oil and gas. And so this is kind of crazy. We have an abundant amount of uh, natural gas. But what do they do? They say you can't ship it to other countries. Uh, they, the LNG, the five natural gas facilities, are now being banned. And this was a betrayal to Europe. Europe was counting on us for natural gas to get away from Russia. So now we're going to put Europe in the clutches of Russia again. How does that enhance our security? At least if somebody come up with that. And the world needs energy more than ever. Civilizations advance with abundant and ever less costly energy. We have it, yet we're not allowed to produce it. And just one example, one of the biggest users of energy today is going to be even more and more in the future is high technology. The cloud today already uses more electricity, more energy, twice as much energy as the entire nation of Japan the third largest economy in the world. So the future for energy is huge. We need every bit of it that we can get. And then as countries develop, they want automobiles too. They want automobiles that work and are affordable. So the amount of the gas is going to be needed, the amount of fossil fuels are going to be needed, electricity is going to be needed as people get better housing and the like. is I won't say infinite, but it's real. Now, what about people say, well, emissions are going to destroy the world? They're not, but let's say they would. The two cleanest fuels are natural gas and nuclear energy. We have abundant natural gas. You just heard Pennsylvania's got the fourth largest reserves of gas in the world, but can't get it out because they can't get pipelines, they can't get ports, they can't get the... So it just lays there. So, and on nuclear, what's happening is that uh, big, exciting things are happening in nuclear technology, most specifically small module reactors, what they call SMRs, that are much smaller, easier to construct, much cheaper to construct, and can be used for uh, small markets, like a campus, or a place for uh, energy for uh, high tech, uh, or uh, a hospital, whatever. And yet this promising technology, cheap, doesn't have the problems of other nuclear power plants, cheap. What's happening is, 
government is regulating it so they can't, one company nearly went bust. They won't let it happen. They just crush it by regulation. So the two things that would save the world, for those who are concerned about it, we all should be, uh, are barred from uh, coming to the rescue. The Calvary's not allowed to come, unlike the old movies. So in terms of, in terms of uh, the, the, the future, get this, even traditional nuclear power, and by the way, the small nuclear power, just remember this, I mean, when people think, gee, can you have small reactors, small plants, just think of the U.S. Navy. Yeah. You know, submarines, yeah. aircraft carriers, yeah. nuclear power have been for decades. And back in the 1950s, the Air Force looked at having nuclear powered airplanes so they could fly long distances and not worry. Then came along the intercontinental ballistic missiles, so they figured they didn't need uh, that kind of aircraft. But they did some real research in what they call molten salt technology for, for, for nuclear power. And that's now being taken up again, being pursued again. Not here in the United States much, but in all places, in all places, Canada is uh, pursuing it. So uh, again, most unlikely places and people do the most unlikely things, positive things. So in, term, in, term, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the world, in terms of where, where we're at, the fact of the matter is when you have eight and a half billion people, you're obviously going to have an impact on the planet, just per se. But you deal with the problems as they come up. If Holland did nothing 500 years ago, it would today be an aquarium. Instead, they developed the whole system. Now, fortunately, the rest of the world is not underwater like Holland. But when problems come up, you deal with them and uh, solve them. There, there's no, uh, the world is thankfully not going to come to an end yet. No, no meteor sighted. Back in 2008, when we had a financial crisis and everyone thought, oh, this is the end, somebody observed rightly, the world can only end once, and this is not it. <laughs> so what kind of world, though, is, is very much in question. So consider this fact. In this century, we have spent over $6 trillion on renewables, primarily windmills and solar panels. What have we done for that $6 trillion? The amount of energy worldwide, globally, that comes from fossil fuels has gone from 86% to 84%. Some say 83. So for 2%, we spent $6 trillion. Now imagine what we could have gotten if that $6 trillion had been used to have safer water, new businesses, new medicines, you think of it. $6 trillion for this. And it turns out, and it turns out, amazingly, that as the research is being done, that in terms of these renewables, especially for EVs, when you go from the beginning, you have immense amounts of mining of minerals, which happen to be in China, in Africa, where they use child labor, in the Congo, immense amount of minerals. And when you go through the making of the battery and the recycling batteries, it turns out that the net plus, in terms of emissions, ain't much different from what fossil fuels do now. So we're spending trillions of dollars on Nothing. Unimaginable not money on nothing. Just consider this. You take a 100 megawatt gas turbine about the size of a house, can supply juice, electricity, for 75,000 homes. Now, the equivalent, remember, the size of a house, to supply the similar amount of energy to, from a wind farm requires 10 square miles, 20 turbines, each taller than the Washington Monument. Together, to construct, takes 50,000 tons of concrete, 30,000 tons of iron ore, 900 tons of unrecycled plastics, those blades, and 700 gallons of lubricants. You know, these things need to be greased up. And, and so just, just, just think of that. One wind turbine alone requires a hole 30 feet deep and 2,500 tons of concrete. Imagine trying to reclaim that. Wow. And, so, and so in terms of the real world, this is manifestly not the answer. By the way, those unrecyclable plastics, you take a couple of wind farms, this is an interesting fact, 
They have more unrecyclable plastics than all the straws in the world. <laughs> Keep that in mind. So, unfortunately, regulations, solved from the modern socialists, go against every modern convenience under attack. I mentioned gas stoves, the automobile, air conditioners. They don't like Texas and Florida, so they don't want you to be, uh, have the air conditioner. Uh, dishwashers, remember those? Dishwashers, which once washed dishes in an hour. Um, now it takes, what, three hours, four hours? They're soon going to be in the Smithsonian. You know, they're now decorations in kitchens, effectively. Uh, the regulations are just making them less and less efficient. So washing machines, lawn mowers, portable generators, shower heads, leaf blowers, snow blowers, snowmobiles, ceiling fans, light bulbs, you name it, they're after it. In New York, pizzas are being banned. Those that are made from wood burning stoves, traditional pizza in there, banned. And they say, they said, well, the, 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 this uh, has too many emissions. Somebody figured out the amount of emissions coming from uh, these stoves that make these kinds of pizzas. Uh, would the coal, the amount of emissions each year. You take John Kerry, our former uh, czar for the planet, his airplane emits more than those pizza places. It would take 849 years for the emissions of those pizzas to match what John Kerry's airplane does each year. Another little thing to keep in mind. So, so what all this does is hurts the dynamism of the American economy. Our dynamism comes from small businesses. And many of them grow into big businesses. We're one of the few countries in the world that every generation develops new big companies. No other country can match it, at least up to now. <clears throat> but unfortunately, all these regulations, remember that apple orchard in upstate New York, trying to do a business now is becoming more and more difficult, both in terms of all the burdens that are being put on and the regulations, the taxation, all the stuff that doesn't do to get the business at hand, and that's hurting us. We're not as dynamic as we used to be. That can be reversed, but our growth has always been higher than, the, the, than Europe and other, and other advanced economies, precisely because we had what you might call this feeder farm, small businesses entrepreneurs, ladders for people getting up in life. So in terms of uh, the regulations, they have to be reversed. If they want to do something like gas stoves or pizzas or automobiles, put it to a vote. They don't dare. They don't dare. So this gets to the other problem, taxes. Taxes, remember, are a price and a burden. They just don't raise money, they're price and a burden. So, so if you raise the price on good things like productive work, risk-taking success, you'll get less of them. Every time we raise tax burdens, you get less economic growth. There was a fellow in Hong Kong who was the financial secretary when it was a, a British uh, territory back in the 1960s, a fellow named uh, Sir John James Copperthwaite. Amazingly, even though he came out of England, even though in England at the time was on a semi-socialist government, he brought real free enterprise to this backward area of Hong Kong. And he slashed taxes, slashed regulations, and uh, guess what? His policy stayed in place, and Hong Kong became one of the poorest areas, became from one of the poorest areas in the world to one of the richest, is now being undone by Beijing. But phenomenal story. They had no natural resource. They had import even water. And yet, boom. <coughs> When he took over, the per capita income was 30% of Britain. Today, it's over 120% of their former uh, colonial master. That's what happens with free enterprise. Again, unlikely, but that's what happens when creativity is unleashed. So in, term, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, taxes, unfortunately, this administration wants more of them, even though we're overtaxed now. Uh, they want to uh, effectively raise the income tax, especially in higher income workers. They want to uh, tax wealth, which uh, destroys it. The Europeans have tried it, it didn't work very well. They want to tax capital gains. They want to tax unrealized gains. So if you have a stock that went up 
Let's say it goes from 10 to $20, you're going to owe a tax on it, even though you haven't sold it. Even though you haven't gotten rid of it. You're going to have to pay a tax on it. Again, they don't realize, some of you may old enough to remember that character, Scrooge McDuck, Disney character, in his money bin, with all the cash and all that. That's what they think wealth is. The money bin, just go in and scoop it up. No, wealth is value. But people value something. And if you create an environment where you can't create things that people want or can afford, wealth goes down. So you tax it, you destroy it. You make it possible. Uh, the market reckons of the future. So you look at uh, the country today, blue versus red. Why are people leaving the blue states? Why are the red states doing better than the blue states? Red states are cutting taxes, blue states are raising them. Message there. This gets to our current federal income tax code, which is an abomination. It's over 10 million words, including all the regulations and court rulings and the like. Nobody knows what's in it, not even the IRS. If you call their hotline, if they deign to answer it, uh, they half the time, a quarter of the time, give you the wrong answer. Yeah. They don't know what's in it. So the huge corrupt thing, why don't we just get rid of it? We spend, the IRS estimates, six billion hours a year filling out tax forms. It costs two to three hundred billion a year to comply with this monstrosity. So go back 20 years, this is a moral issue, go back 20 years. Imagine over a hundred billion hours of brain power wasted, literally trillions of dollars wasted complying with this idiot corrupt tax code that nobody understands. And imagine again if that had gone to new businesses, new products, new services, new medical devices, new cures, how much better off the world would be, all that brain power going for something <coughs> productive. Now my version of the flat tax, which is a single rate, family of four would owe no federal income tax in the first $53,000 of salary. Only 17 cents on the dollar above that. No tax on savings, no death taxes. You should be allowed to leave the world unmolested by the IRS. You've suffered enough during your lifetime. And, and you'd end up with a more prosperous economy and more revenue, which hopefully would be used to cut taxes. But why, as a free people, we continue to put up with this monstrosity? Maybe the time will come and we'll get another candidate will forthrightly advocate this. I think this cuts across the poll show all lines. Why are we wasting so much brain power and money and resources on this thing? Then this gets to another big problem, obviously inflation. One of the things, unfortunately, about inflation, well, inflation, there are two kinds of inflation. One kind is what you might call non-monetary. These are events that raise the cost of things through, could be, Storms, could be war, uh, or the shipping attacks that are taking place now, what happened tragically in the last night in Baltimore, could affect prices. War, lockdowns, obviously had an enormous impact on prices. That's non-monetary inflation. There's nothing the Federal Reserve can do about that. Raising or cutting interest rates is not going to uh, open up the Red Sea again, or make sure the Suez Canal is not going to be molested with the rocket ships. And so that's non monetary. Most of the time, with that, you just let the economy heal. If they'd done nothing after COVID or let the economy heal, we'd be in much better shape today. One quick example after World War II. After World War II, it took time to go from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy. You don't go overnight from making uh, tanks uh, to uh, making refrigerators. It takes time. So, for about two, two and a half years, prices were going up. A lot of uh, Fusion supply chains all mucked up, but we eventually got through it and boomed as never before. But again, let people heal it. They don't need the government going in and mucking it up. So that's non monetary. Monetary inflation, traditional kind, means lowering the value of your money, usually by creating too much of it. Lowering the value of money. Money, think of money like a claim check. You go to a restaurant, you might check your coat or something. What do you get? You get a piece of plastic or a piece of paper. 
worthless in and of itself, but a claim on something. Buy a ticket to an event, whether it's a piece of paper or ellipses on your handheld. It's a claim on a real service, real product. Money is like claim checks, only it's for a vast market. You take your claim check and you can go and buy whatever you wish. Best, do whatever you want. Money, in that sense, measures value. Like a scale measures weight, clock measures time, ruler measures space. Money measures value. It's not a commodity, it's a measuring stick. And when you muck it up, bad things happen. Imagine what would happen if the Federal Reserve was in charge of the Time Bureau. They decided to float the clock. So they had 60 minutes in one hour, one day, 48 minutes the day after, 32 the day, you know life would be confusing. And you buy a pound of cheese, one pound. Well, you don't know, is that 16 ounces, 18 ounces, 14 ounces? Imagine baking a cake with a floating clock. It says, bake the batter 30 minutes. You have to wonder, is that nominal minutes? Inflation adjusted minutes? Texas minute, Mexican minute, New York minute? Life would be, but when we have unstable money, it, it does the same thing. Unfortunately, no central banker talks about stable value for currencies. Just let them go their own way. And so we have much less growth. Now, the traditional way to do it is by the gold standard, which we had until 1971. And uh, for 180 years, despite depression, civil war, and everything else, we had the highest growth rates in human history, on average, despite all these things that happened in between. If we had maintained, since the early 1970s, that historic 180-year average, take household income. Median income is about, I mean, whose measure you is about 70, 75,000. If we'd had that traditional growth rate, this is over a 50 year period compounded, that would be 115, 120,000 today. And don't you think people would be a lot happier with $40,000 of extra spendable income than what we have today? Better prospects for the future? That's what happens. And closing on that, the Federal Reserve, unfortunately, has this crazy theory crazy theory that the way to cure inflation is by depressing the economy. And that's why you hear all this discussion on interest rate. Gee, is it, would, would this uh, stimulate the economy too much and bring back inflation? No, it wouldn't. Prices are always changing in a free economy, people's preferences. Leave it alone. But they want to keep depressing it until they think they've conquered inflation. It's nonsense. By the way, for those of you who are interested, it's called the Phillips Curve named after a New Zealand economist who said there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Now, history shows it's nonsense, but it's wholly rid of the Fed. They, they, they still are worried that if the economy gets a booming again, that will bring back inflation. No, it won't. Leave it alone. So in closing, let me just say a few words about health care. Why do we have a health care crisis? Because we don't have real free markets in health care. We don't have a socialized system like other countries do, but we don't have really free markets. Even though they say we do, we don't. It's all third party, whether it's insurance companies, government, Medicare, Medicaid, it's third party. Hospitals know their revenue comes not from making you happy, but from how well they negotiate with insurers and government. And as a result, we get practices being bought out, regulations piling on, the agency in charge of Medicare Medicaid issued 11,000 pages of regs a year. So uh, docs can't uh, have independent practices. They're becoming rarer and rarer. And so in terms of uh, and prices, prices, try to get a price. Not always easy, even though the regs said the hospital's supposed to tell you what it costs. Very hard to get. And in terms of the, where the patient sits in this world, even though we have a great system, if you, have a, if you get cancer or something, you want to be here, not, not anywhere else. But in the system we have, think of it this way. The lousiest motel in America or the world wouldn't dare put you in a room with another guest, a sick guest, with a curtain in between. And that's still routine in many hospitals. A real hotel wouldn't do that. A spa wouldn't do that. But 
fortunate, but so, so the problem we know real free, that's been beginning to change. If you want to see what the future is going to look like, go online and look at something called sesamecare.com and, and uh, starting to grow in the country. And you'll see things from uh, Dr. Zilch, 50% uh, off a knee exam on Thursday, uh, like, like, like a Priceline or something like that. People want to know what these things cost. Another thing is the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. They don't take insurance. They post all their prices online, so you don't get a bill three years later. You don't get facility fees or any of that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and if, 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 the, if, the, if, the, if the procedure goes above the price, the stated price, they eat it, not you. And, and they have all board certified surgeons, so their outcomes are as good or better than the ho other hospitals. And their prices are 25 percent of what a typical hospital would charge. That's what free enterprise can do: good quality, but less and less real cost. So in the future of healthcare, we've got to fight for free markets and not have this trend of government having a bigger role, the biggies having a bigger role, and get free markets. It's starting to happen. We got to make sure. It's not undone. So in closing, one of the things you have to watch out for in the world, and we'll get to the Q&A. One of the things you have to watch out for, though, we do live in a dangerous world. Maybe we can get to that in the Q&A. But the world is as dangerous today as it's been since the 1930s. Unfortunately, American weakness is breeding a very unstable world. Putin thinks he's going to win in Ukraine. He thinks that's going to be a bridgehead to uh, help him recreate his empire. Beijing is looking, is the US going to uh, back down? Hey, Ukraine costs a lot of money, they back off. So that means ultimately there's no price to pay for aggression. It's all connected together. Iran thinks we're past our prime. So they feel they're going to get and become a nuclear power and all what that means. So that's the big cloud over there. Not the American people, not our culture, most of it. Um, but, in term, but in terms of the belief and people being able to pursue their own opportunities, do their own thing. So I am an optimist. I think that capitalism, free enterprise, properly done, doesn't mean it's perfect. James Madison, the father of our Constitution, pointed out. He said if we were angels, we'd not need government. We do not need laws. Manifestly, we're not angels. But we're perhaps grandchildren, and they perhaps are only a certain age. And, and so you do need laws. But you need sensible laws and rules, not the kind of stuff we're getting bombarded with today. So this is why this election is so important coming up. Alexis de Tocqueville, French aristocrat, visited this country in the 1830s and wrote a book called The American Democracy. One of the things that astounded him, what he called voluntary associations, people coming together for a shared purpose. In Europe, you waited for permission. You asked. He said, in America, you just go and do it. Whether it's a professional association, fixing a bridge, building a hospital, whatever it is, you just come together and do it. Voluntary associations. He said, this is a great way of preparing people to be citizens of a republic taking things, doing things on their own, working with others for a shared purpose. That's one of the reasons why we have such a, we've had historically such a dynamic economy. Where people bustle around, looking things, trying to make things happen. And one of the things to keep in mind is that the way you get ahead is not with things, but with knowledge. Tom Sowell pointed out this. He said, what's the difference between us people today and people in the Stone Age? Same bodies, same planet, same resources. The difference between them and us, we know more. We have more knowledge. And if knowledge is not destroyed, we can move ahead. You have a natural disaster, we can repair, rebuild, and move forward. After World War II, tens of millions of people killed. Massive physical destruction. Experts thought it would be years before they'd be recovered. Within a handful of years, thanks to US military security, People could do things and not fear the Russians. Within a few years, Western Europe and Japan exceeded pre-war levels of production. Knowledge was not destroyed. New knowledge could be created. 
So that's why real learning, real freedom to learn, to experiment is so important. So the question is in closing, are we going to continue what De Tocqueville saw? Or are we going to go the way of Europe? Are you wait for things? You're always looking over your shoulder, and the big things don't get done. Thank you.